So you're pretty still waiting for my talk, despite a few applause. And so you think you are doing nothing. But actually, one part of your body is extremely active, actually using up to 20% of your energy. That part of your body, of course, is your brain. You're smelling odors, you're feeling the temperature, you're looking at the slides, you're listening to me. Uh, eventually, you may be understanding what I'm saying, and hopefully, if I'm really lucky, uh, you will actually remember part of what I'm saying. And all these incredible functions we know are performed by this absolutely fantastic machine uh, we have in the brain, we have in the, in the head that's uh, called the brain. And despite its complexity and uh, its utmost importance, and also, unfortunately, the fact that it's so affected in certain uh, diseases, we still know very little about the brain. It's still uh, very much of a black box, in fact. And uh, what I want to tell you today is that, in fact, using light, uh, researchers are starting to know more and more about the function of the brain. And uh, what I'm going to present to you is how, uh, using a variety of imaging methods and lights, we can actually look at what's inside this thing. That's a human brain. So that's a human brain about 1.5 kilo of mainly water, 70% water, so 30% of tissue. Not much, right? But this not much is actually doing so many fantastic things, creating arts, writing books, thinking, making also some not so nice things, but that's an another story. And so uh, we are going to see how we can look inside that using light. So to look inside the brain, uh, we need models, of course. It would be fantastic to look directly into the human brain. Uh, unfortunately, I'm not so sure many of you would be ready to give me a little piece of their brain to do experiments, right? Maybe somebody? No, you see. So we need models. Uh, we need two types of models. We need conceptual models and we need experimental models. So conceptual models mean uh, models of uh, learning and memory and brain function. And really, that's what's been really fascinating me from the very beginning, is this incredible function that has a brain to store information, process that information, and use it to change our behavior as a function of what's happening uh, outside uh, in the outer world. And so there is one easy uh, protocol, one easy concept of memory that uh, researchers have used a lot, that we're going to talk about a little. It's called spatial memory. What is spatial memory? Uh, when you came here for the first time, some of you probably got lost, probably took you a while to find uh, the, right, uh, the right room. We all know that when you're going to come back the second time, it's going to be easier, and probably the third time, you will come directly to this room without getting lost, because you've memorized from cues, from in, uh, indices in the environment, how to, how to come here. So that's called uh, spatial memory. And so to work on, on, on that memory and to understand how, how it, uh, it's actually uh, working, uh, we need then experimental models. And the experimental models many, many researchers use are mice, uh, because mice learn very well, and uh, we can actually study that. So we are using mainly two models. One of them is called the Y-Maze. You cannot see it very well here, uh, but you'll see it on the internet. Uh, so this Y maze uh, is a, has cues on the side, and so when the mice is put at the entry of the maze, initially uh, with a reward only in one of the arms, uh, initially the mice doesn't know there's a reward, it's going to get lost, it's going to go away, it's a catastrophe. And then uh, little by little, as we work more, more and more, Second time is better. Ah, she's nearly there. And that's it. She found it. She found the cheese. And uh, she's going to memorize that thanks to the indices in the environment. And that's spatial memory. Another, um, another uh, way uh, to do that uh, is to use what's called the Morris water maze. What's the Morris water maze? It's a tank of water. And uh, in fact, mice hate water. 
The only thing they want to do when they are in water is just find a spot where they can get out of the water to get dry. And so researchers are using that, uh, putting the mice in a tank of water, and then uh, with a little platform so that uh, the mice can uh, find a platform and escape uh, the water. And so around this water tank, there are cues, you know, diagrams, uh, things, so that the, the mice actually sees where she is, and uh, she can know where is the platform when she's found it, and then she can memorize the location of this platform. So typically, we can then track the movement of the mice, and we measure the length, the, the amount of time it takes the mice to actually find the platform, and as the mice improve its performance, we can see how long it takes the mice to actually remember well where was the platform. And that's a very, very efficient way to actually measure memory. So that's an example. So first, we teach the mice how to find a platform with a transparent liquid. Then we use milk in the, in the same uh, tank so that the mice doesn't know where is the platform. And so it finds it initially by random. But then, thanks to the cues which are surrounding the, the, the tank of, of liquid, uh, then she can uh, remember uh, where is it and then accelerate her finding. And so that's a very nice paradigm. And we can actually use that also to test for diseases. And so here, uh, what you're going to see is on the left side, uh, wild type normal mice. And on the right side is a mice uh, that's affected with a disease that's very close to the human Alzheimer disease. So it's a very good Alzheimer model. And so these mice have been trained. And uh, you're going to see that the left mice has learned where is the platform, and it finds the platform very rapidly. Within a few seconds, it goes back to the platform, looking at the cues which are surrounding. But on the right side, the Alzheimer mice uh, just doesn't remember uh, where, is the, where is the platform. It, it has forgotten. It has been unable to remember uh, where was the platform. And so uh, that's what we want to study, really in molecular terms. And we want to study what's really the molecular, the cellular correlates of, uh, of this uh, function. So we all know uh, that the brain information processing in may, is mainly done by neurons. Neurons are not the major type of cells in the, in the brain. The major type of cells in the brain are called glia. Glia play a very important role. My colleagues that work on glia make sure I say every time that glia is very important. But even though it's very important, it's neurons which are really doing information processing. And that's because uh, neurons form a very interconnected network, you know, with billions of cells, uh, each connecting uh, 10,000 of other cells. So it, altogether, it's a humongous number of synapses, those zones of contact between neurons uh, that are present in the brain. And those things are very small, very numerous, very complex, and that's uh, what we want to look at. So that's a spine with a synapse, uh, two cells connecting one to the other. And uh, it's really thought now, really believe pretty strongly, that these synapses are, are really the main location of storage of information in the brain. And so understanding how it works, how you can store information, is very important. The problem is that that's very small. It's so tiny. They are only a micron size. So that means 1 20th of a hair. And we want to study those, possibly in live brain, uh, to understand how they are organized. So we know quite a bit about their function. In this uh, movie here, what you're going to see is the basic summary of what we know about synaptic transmission in the basal state. So you have those synapses, sites of contact between two cells. And then you have, on the bottom cell, you have the receptors. On the top cell, you have the neurotransmitter. And when there is an action potential that comes in, the neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic cleft in between the cells and then activates the receptors in the postsynaptic cell transmitting information. And that's the basis of synaptic transmission. What you see on this movie is that receptors are not immobile. They move. They move all the time. And that's something very important uh, we are going to come back to, actually. So let's go back to our synapse, the scheme of the synapse. You see those receptors, those green and red uh, entities. And really, to understand how a synapse works, how it stores memory, we want to be able to look at those receptors in live cells, if possible, in the live brain, if possible, even in the live animal. And so to do that, uh, what we do is that we label those receptors with bulbs, with light bulbs. They are called fluorophores, uh, to look at them. 
uh, to try to see how they are organized. But what I told you is that those synapses are very, very small. And there is a physics law you may remember from your school days that's called the limit of diffraction, the law of diffraction, that tells you that you cannot look at an object which is smaller. Uh, you cannot differentiate objects which are closer to uh, half the wavelength of, of light. So that means that although you have a single receptor, which would be a point source, actually uh, the spot of the light uh, that it gives you is very big. It's nearly the size of a synapse. So altogether, you cannot distinguish two receptors which are close by. And in fact, within a synapse, uh, if you label them and look at them all together, uh, what you see is very blurry. That's this image on the left, this spine, which is completely blurry because it's blurred by a diffraction limit. And so actually, uh, very recently, only in the last few years, uh, researchers with the help of chemists and physicists and opticians and biologists uh, have developed a whole new series of uh, experimental ways to look at objects which are smaller uh, than the size of, uh, than the limit of diffraction. And that's called optical nanoscopy. It's been awarded the Nobel Prize uh, to three people uh, last year uh, for the development of super-resolved fluorescence microscopy. What's the idea? The idea, in fact, is pretty simple, is to look at each object one by one instead of looking at them all together. This is actually a technique uh, that's been developed already uh, nearly 100 years ago uh, by neo-impressionism, that's called pointillism. You can actually reconstruct a full image just by using several dots, and little by little you reconstruct a full image. Well, we do the same thing for synapses. We are going to label individual fluorophores, Look, localize with very high precision those individual fluorophores and do that over and over again. And from a fuzzy image on the left, as we localize each single fluorophore one by one, we can get a much clearer uh, picture of, of the object. So that's an example of a neuron visualized with classical light microscopy. It's pretty fuzzy. You do see the synapses, but they are not very precise. You cannot certainly get any information about the organization of the receptors. And then if you turn on this method to look at molecules one by one, you actually start seeing something which is much more crisp. Now you can really distinguish what's happening inside the synapse. That's the nanoscopic scale organization of receptors inside the synapse. But that's still fixed, that's still dead tissue. And what we want to do is look at that in live cells. Well, we can actually do that. We can track the movement of these individual receptors. First, we can reconstitute in 3D the image of the, of the synapse, pretty image. But more interesting, we can track the movement of receptors. You see all these little red balls are individual receptors for neurotransmitters that we track in a real live neuron in real time to get their movement. So that's a big finding that we made uh, more than 10 years ago, that receptors are not immobile, but are actually moving all the time. Now, that's the basal state. What happens when you learn? What happens when you store a memory? Well, uh, I think we've progressed in that direction, uh, again, using a model, using a model of neurons, and stimulating neurons electrically to mimic what's happening when you learn something, and looking at what happens to the movement of these receptors. So that's uh, what's represented here. In this movie, you see the same type of neurons. We are going to follow the same type of receptors. But this time, we are going to apply an electric stimulation, as if you were stimulated by my talk and learning something. And what you see when the red bar happens is that receptors actually get immobilized very quickly. They get immobilized, they get accumulated in the synapse, and that is, we think, the cellular basis of memory, accumulating more receptors to strengthen the strength of these uh, synapses. So in this movie is a summary of uh, actually what we think happens during uh, this learning. There is a strong activity from the presynaptic cell. A lot of neurotransmitter is released in the synaptic cleft that activates a whole complex and the enzymatic cascade that we start to know uh, pretty well. And then uh, receptors are modified in their properties and they get stabilized, they get accumulated, and there is more and more receptors that are present in front of the site of transmitter release so that actually the synapse gets stronger and so that's uh, cellular, it's called cellular memory and that's probably the substrate for uh, when you learn uh, some, something. So what's the future? Now we can look at uh, synapse uh, memory. 
we would like to be able to modify it. We would like to be able to modify memories. And that's actually probably going to become possible very soon. And that's thanks to the development of a whole other variety of uh, tools, genetic tools, which are called channel rhodopsin. Those are molecules that can get activated by light to either inhibit or stimulate neurons. And you can, you can have, have, in fact, put those uh, molecules uh, into uh, live mice. And uh, using fiber optics, such as, uh, such as this thing, exactly the same thing that you put in your mice here, you can actually uh, change the memory of the mice. And so the dream is uh, probably one day uh, we'll be able to do that in humans, to cure diseases and uh, to modify brain activity. So it's a bit scary, of course, as always with scientists. There's a good side and a bad side. But uh, anyway, uh, it's very clear that the future of neuroscience is extremely bright thanks to light. And I thank you very much.